So if you had to pick a spiritual song that you would want to sing on your way to worship today in your car, are you a singer? Not really. Nobody is a singer. Yeah, nobody going, oh yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay, well, no one would hear you in the car, correct? <laughs> if you were driving here singing. So if you had to pick a worship song to sing on your way to church this morning, uh, what song would you pick? And this is a rhetorical question demanding an audible response. <laughs> I have to tell you, so you would... How great thou art. Yes, that's, we could just stop right there. Yeah. Amazing grace. Great is thy faithfulness. Love you, Lord. Yes, thank you. Vic, wow, you guys are picking all these old hymns. Victory in Jesus. Yeah. Abide with me. Oh, that's an excellent one. Yeah, washed, washed in the blood. Is that what you said? Yeah, I love that one. That one's fun to play on the piano, by the way. Yeah, I like the, the keys on that one. What else? No one said anything over here. Sorry, I, I need to stand over here. Old Rugged Cross. We haven't had one chorus yet. Thank you, Lord. Thank, well, that's a 1960s chorus. Yeah, that's like pass it on, you know. It only takes a spark to get a... Remember that one? Yeah, I never quite understood that one in the 60s. Like, why they would pick that one. But Thank You, Lord is a great old one. Yeah. Power in the name of Jesus. Yeah, anyone else? In the, garden. in the garden. I love in the garden. Well, as a landscaper, I, <laughs> it's true. When I was a landscaper, I actually used to sing that as I would hula ho uh, commercial sites because I love that. Uh, I just love the fact that the Lord is with me in the garden. Uh, well, a great old song. Uh, Any more? We only had one from the upper stories near God. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody up here? What is it? Yeah, 10,000 Reasons. Yes. What is it? Lord is my salvation. Yes. Well, I don't, I don't know that. Is that a hymn? No. No. <laughs> That's why I don't know it. Yeah. That's good. Did you sing any songs on your way here? Did you? Did you listen to any Christian music when you came here? Did you? Did you? Okay. What's this got to do with anything? Uh, everything. A uh, particular song, song that we're going to look at today uh, is called A Song of Ascent. Uh, and A Song of Ascent, ascent, like going up, the, the word in Hebrew means to go up a hill or to go up a step. Um, so if you look at Psalms 120, I'm going to have to do a little preparatory work before we dig into this psalm because it is the first psalm of the Psalms of Ascent. So the Psalms of Ascent go from chapters 120 uh, through 134. So I have to lay the groundwork as we dig into these psalms, like, well, what are they about? Because if you read the, the header on all of them, it says uh, in the header, it's a psalm of ascents. Uh, and that particular uh, statement is part of the Hebrew text. So in the English text, it, it's, it's like, a, like a statement of the title, but you might not think it's verse one. That, that's verse one in Hebrew. So that's inspired. So what is a song of ascent? So these particular uh, songs, uh, we don't know the musical quality to them. We have the, the lyrics. Uh, were sung by the Jewish worshipers as they went uh, to Israel primarily three times a year as dictated by the Torah. So based on Exodus chapter 23, 14 to 17, uh, they had to go to the temple wherever they were uh, at Passover, at Pentecost, and at booths, or also known as tabernacles. And as they would go they would sing the songs of ascent. So if you've ever been to uh, Jerusalem, you'll know that it's a, a high elevation up in the mountains. Uh, so if you're in another part of Israel, chances of you having to go up to Jerusalem are great because uh, everything around there is kind of downhill. Uh, so if you are uh, over on the coast, over toward Tel Aviv, uh, you've got to go up what would be called the low-lying hills, or in Hebrew it's called the Shephelah, to get up to the, the area of Jerusalem where the temple was. So the Song of Ascent uh, had the um, quality of actually moving from a lower place to a higher place uh, to get to uh, go to, to worship God. Uh, so it talks about the approach to the temple. When you got to, uh, to Jerusalem, uh, singing your songs of ascent, you could still imagine uh, three times a year, worshipers streaming all throughout Jerusalem on all the, the road systems of, of Israel to get uh, to the temple. They would, you would hear them off in the distance singing these songs. Uh, it would be awesome, wouldn't it? I mean, just hearing the music as the worshipers sang. Uh, when they got to the, the temple, uh, they would have uh, a been uh, as, they, as they approached from the eastern side, they would have approached what would be called the Hulda Gates. 
Uh, and I can show you the Hulda gates here. This is from a model uh, of Jerusalem uh, uh, that I took uh, years ago. Um, so those would be the Hulda gates, uh, and these, that'd be the Solomonic portico up above that. Uh, but you would go through the, come up the platform through those two gates, the Hulda gates. Uh, Hulda in Hebrew means mouse or a tunnel. Uh, and so what you would do is you go through those gates and you go up through a long, dark tunnel before you emerged on the temple platform. And the first thing that you would see as you came through the mouse tunnel would be the glory of the temple standing in front of you. It would be breathtaking. Uh, but uh, Hulda also represents uh, the prophetess Hulda, uh, who prophesied in this area uh, in 2 Kings chapter 22, 14 uh, through 20. She was the prophetess. This is where she did business, as it were, for God. Uh, but as you would uh, t approach the Hulda gates, you would uh, approach it based on the step structure of the southern wall. So uh, these are pictures uh, I'm going to show you that I took I've, over the years that I've taken people to Israel. Um, you, you will notice as the steps ascend up to the Hulda gates, uh, they're not all equal, are they? So you have a wide step and you have a short step. Then you have a wide step and you have a short step. So what would this do to you if you've got hundreds and hundreds of people walking into the Hulda gates, uh, singing all the ascent songs? What would this do to the traffic structure? Why do all of our steps in the back going up to the top, why are they all the same? Because it makes it easier to go up, correct? Imagine if they were a long one and a short one and a long, it would slow everybody down. And so that's what they did. It was like traffic control going into the Hula Gates. They slowed everybody down. Uh, and it also forced them to stop so they could contemplate who they're going to stand in the presence of, God. You didn't just waltz into his presence. You took your time. And so as you went in, in the structure of these steps, it would force you to stop and contemplate. You're going to go stand in the presence of God at the temple. And it also slowed you down so as you ascended, you could sing the songs. You can imagine, once you got up to the top of the platform before you went into the Hulda Gates, the next slide uh, will show you, uh, if you and, the, and the, uh, uh, Solomon the Great uh, um, uh, boarded the gates or bricked the gates closed so you can't, can't get in anymore. But um, if, when you got at the top here and you look to the right, this is the Mount of Olives. It's just right there. And that, that's where Jesus, in Matthew 24 to 25, gave us uh, the directions of what the, the end of time will be like with great precision. So that's, that's how close it was. And in between the end of that wall and the, and the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley, which is not very big. And then if you turn and just look back this direction, right behind you there uh, is the house of Caiaphas, where Jesus was taken for in, uh, interrogation and, and punishment. So everything's very close, uh, not as big as what you think. And so as a, as a worshiper came here, as you're getting up to the top step, you're hearing the worshipers singing these songs that they all knew. Uh, when you got to the top and you went up through the gates, uh, here is what you would see is a picture. So those little, uh, little uh, knobs sticking up there next to the Solomon uh, Monic Portico, those would be the places that all the worshipers would come out onto the temple flat platform. So it's 24 acres of inlaid rock, mind-boggling. So the first thing that you would see would be the temple before you uh, with its white stone uh, outlined with gold, uh, and it's built like a crouching lion because uh, uh, the Messiah is from the tribe of Judah. So it has, a, has a, this type of structure, and it's face, facing east. Uh, when the sun would rise. So when the sun would rise, it would hit the door of the temple and, and flood it uh, with brilliant light. Uh, so it's amazing what you would see as coming up there. But I can imagine as you got on the temple platform, uh, coming up here for, say, Passover or for uh, Pentecost, you would hear worshipers singing. What would they be singing? Psalms 120 through 134. All their little groups would be singing all their songs uh, to prepare themselves to walk into God's presence. So the reason why I asked you to, what psalm would you pick is because when you look at the structure of these psalms, I highly doubt you would have picked Psalm 20 to be number one. Because listen to what this song says. Now, bear in mind, these psalms are put, uh, structured in such a way that uh, Psalms 120 through 121 talk about the ascent to Jerusalem. You're, you're walking there. Uh, psalms 122 to uh, uh, 134, uh, you're already on the Temple Mount worshiping God. So 120 and 121, I'm headed there. Would you have picked this for the first one? Notice the nature of this song, a song of ascents. Uh, in my trouble, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me. Uh, what did he say in his prayer? Deliver me, uh, deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, 
from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? Verse 4. Sharp arrows of the warrior with the burning coals of a broom tree. Woe is me, for I sojourn in Meshech, for I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long has my soul had its dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, shalom. But when I speak, well, the opposition of my culture is for what? War. War. Would you have picked this as your happy, uplifting, encouraging song? What say you? Probably not. You would have probably picked one of those hymns that you picked uh, and been singing that. And then what did he pick by way of divine inspiration? Psalm 120. Remember, he's just leaving his house. He and his family and friends, they're singing. And they start off with Psalm 120 because they're heading to the temple. And what are they singing about? Oh, Lord, we live in a hostile culture. Huh? Do you live in a hostile culture? Uh, Ever more so. Now, I, we, as we dig into this thing, I make no apologies because this is where God, the Holy Spirit, starts, correct? This is where he starts us. Uh, and as you're approaching worship, uh, is, is realizing what kind of culture you live in. So does this necessarily mean that all of our culture is hostile to the Christian faith? Answer, no. No, because we have many great Christians in, in politics. We have many great Christians in education, in medicine. I mean, all throughout the culture, teachers, educators, all throughout the culture, we have many great people. And then we also have many great Americans who are just moral people, right? They may not be Christians, but they are for morals, for the Constitution, logical reasoning, etc. correct? But it's getting ever more increasing hostile. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out. Hence the need for Psalm 120. Uh, He's in this, in this passage, he's extremely well, what we would call authentic and transparent. And is saying, as I, as I head toward worship, I must first realize that I live in a culture that's anti-God. They're not for God. And they're anti-me because I worship God, the living God. And so when you likewise come to worship, you should be uh, preparing yourself for worship in the morning by saying, God, I realize the type of world I live in. Because there's evil and there's sin and I, and I deal with it. And that drains you, doesn't it? It drains you. And so why do you need worship? You need worship to, well, recharge the batteries. As you get together with other Christians, like-minded believers, the Spirit of God descends, God's Word's taught, and you walk out of here, not, hopefully not feeling, man, I'm just totally depressed after that sermon. We don't want that. We want you to walk out going, I am ready for the week. I, am, I know what God wants me to do. So that's what this would do. Um, being candid. So let's look at what he says and what he's going to teach us here in the first Psalm of Ascent as they headed to Jerusalem. Uh, was, he's going to answer this basic question uh, in this Psalter. Here's the question. Here's how I put it, the main idea. How do you as a saint, I'm assuming that you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, how does a person become a Christian? Jesus Christ, the faith of a child. God, I'm a sinner, and boy, do I need you as my Savior. And the day you trust him as your Savior, uh, he makes you his child forever. But speaking to Christians today, what is he saying to Christians? Well, how do you, as a, as a saint, live effectively among, what did he, what's he talk about? Liars. People who do not tell the truth. How do I do that? Um, he's going to give you uh, the prescriptions of how to do that. Uh, and we'll follow his prescriptions as we move through the, the text. Because it is not fun being lied to, right? Like if you go on eHarmony and you're single and you're dating, why are you laughing? <laughs> I haven't said anything funny yet. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Do they lie on eHarmony? You don't know what eHarmony is? It's a, it's a match, matching website. Yeah, they like, because I've had people here. In fact, I would say if there's 10 people here who are married, I would say probably eight of them, it's through some kind of online dating website. Totally shocked me. Every time I ask somebody, it's like, this is how they met. Uh, and so the last thing you want to do is have somebody lie to you on that site, correct? And, and so, so they, they lie. Uh, People lie all the time uh, when, when they get pulled over by a police officer for some kind of infraction. <laughs> what do they do? All kinds of excuses as to why. Uh, and my dad used to tell me as a federal agent all the excuses he heard why there was drugs and cocaine in the car. <laughs> I've, I have heard some funny stories from my dad. Like, Are you kidding me? They told you that? Anyway, so do, do people lie? Yeah. yeah. Did you lie this week? See, no one's going to talk now. <laughs> So let's get into this. That's too convicting. So verse one, he's going to tell us that, uh, well, how do you handle a culture that's bent online? Well, uh, number one, be prayerful, be prayerful. He says, 
It, this is a song of ascents. I cried in my trouble to the Lord, and notice the cause effect. I cried to God, and he totally ignored me. What does it say? I cried to the Lord, and he answered me. So he's done this before, right? He said, my track record with God is when I'm hitting a complex, difficult time, I cry out to him, and he, he comes through and answers in a profound way. So the first thing you should do is you face a culture that doesn't tell the truth anymore, by and large, uh, is you must be in that hostile culture prayerful. You must be prayerful. So I would put it to this way. Uh, if you're facing a, you know, uh, a child that's lying to you, a husband who's lying to you, uh, a culture that's lying to you, whatever your situation is, because I don't know what it is, God, God does, the very first thing you should do is don't call me. You can call me eventually. Uh, don't call a psychiatrist. Uh, don't, don't call your best friends, although there's wisdom in the counsel of the many, as Proverbs says uh, from Solomon's pen. That's all true. But God should be your first stop, not your last stop. Did you hear me? God should be your what? Your first stop, not your last stop. So if you call me about a complex situation, I should probably ask you, first question is, have you had a little talk with Jesus? <laughs> Did you tell him about your troubles? Did you? And if you tell me, well, no, I haven't really connected with him yet. Why? Yeah, well, I, I missed that sermon on 120. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so if you're living with, in a lying situation, you should be a person who approaches God. Now, why? Well, notice what he says here. I, he says, in my trouble, I cried to the Lord. Now, the, the English text flips it around like that, but that, that's not how the Hebrew text is. Uh, the Hebrew text starts with the, the statement, to the Lord. To the Lord. I cried in my trouble. It's, it's reversed. And so in English, you have to kind of flip it around and make it smoother. Uh, but it is put that way because it's not a verb to say to the Lord. Uh, and that makes it highly emphatic. So he's saying, uh, I go to God first because he, he has the answers and the power to my situation. So I emphatically go to the Lord first. Uh, he, because he's the great covenant God. And he says, I go to the Lord uh, in my trouble. Well, the word for trouble uh, is, is uh, sorah in Hebrew, and it means to be in a tight, restrictive situation. So it is the word that is used in Genesis chapter 42, uh, verses 21 and following, uh, to describe uh, Joseph being thrown into the pit by his brothers who want to get rid of him because they're jealous of him. So they threw him in a dark, dank pit, and that is called a place of trouble. It's a place of constriction. So if you have a... Um, uh, what is it when, you, when you, uh, you're afraid of tight spaces? Yeah, claustrophobia. Yeah, you, you have that? You know, it's tight. I mean, I got to get out of here. Uh, it, it's like that. It's a tight place. This is the word that is used when Jonah is inside the belly of the fish. Uh, and he talks about uh, his trouble. Uh, it's the word for restrictive. Boy, would that have been restrictive. You know, you can't move. It's dark. You're in there with anything the fish swallowed. Uh, and where are you going? Uh, so it is like that. So he says, when you're dealing with trouble, trouble is like that. Now he hasn't identified what the trouble is yet. He's going to, it's going to be lying, but, but that can cover anything. And so he says in your, in your trouble, in your tight, restrictive situation, because that's what bad situations do. They restrict you. Like, what do I do? What kind of decision do I make? What ethically should I be doing in this position, etc.? cetera? Uh, it's restrictive. So when you're in that kind of situation, you should, to go back to the old hymn, have a little talk with who? Jesus. Why? Tell him about your troubles. Why? He's the Lord. He cares. He knows. He's waiting for you to talk to him. And he's, he's also set up adverse situations to get you to lean on him. And so he says, I cried to the Lord, uh, and God answered me. That is how God rolls. The devil's going to whisper in your ear, why are you going to talk to him? I mean, every time you talk to him, he never comes through. Uh, yeah, he does may not be exactly how you wanted him to come through, but he'll, he'll come through. So uh, if you f face a culture that has a penchant for lying, which our culture does by and large, uh, what should you do first and foremost? Be prayerful about your situation to the God of the cosmos who knows your situation. Number two, verse two, be bold, be bold. Verse two, what does he ask God? He's very bold. Uh, he says, deliver my soul, O Lord, from... Now he's going to tell you, he's going to go from the general to the specific. He's going to go from, I was talking about trouble, now I need to identify the trouble. He, he says, well, my trouble is lying lips. Uh, and then he says, uh, God, if you don't get that, well, I'm talking about a deceitful tongue. So this is an imperative in the Hebrew text. So it's, a, it's an... Can you command God to do anything? 
No, you can just kind of make a suggestion. Why? Well, it's, 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 the, it's the you, the finite, speaking to the infinite. So it's just, God, in this particular situation, as complex that is, as it is, uh, if I could command you, I need some help. I mean, could you help me? And so he says, God, deli- deliver me. Uh, the word uh, in Hebrew is nasal. Uh, nasal means, uh, in Amos chapter 4, verse 11, where it's used in a literal way, uh, it denotes uh, pulling something out of a blazing fire. See, because if you're in a world, in a situation like where you work or your family life, and it is engulfed in uh, lying, it's like everything's on fire to the point where it's like, how do, how do I function in this? And he says, God, it is so complex where, where I'm at. Uh, I, I need you to reach into my situation and grab me and yank me out of this. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to deal with it anymore. You ever been there? Uh, Isaiah chapter 59 uh, is an illustration of getting yanked out of the fire, uh, according to the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 59, verse 11, notice what he says. He's, this is uh, why the nation of Israel was imploding as a nation. He says, all of us, all of us uh, as he's saying, saints, we growl like what? <laughs> yeah, notice why they're growling. Uh, we moan sadly like doves. Why are they doing that? Well, we hope for what? We hope for justice. I ain't saying it. Uh, There is none for uh, salvation. Uh, We hope for salvation, but it's far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee. Our sins testify against us, speaking as a nation. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing, Transgressing and denying the Lord, turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart lying words. And justice is based on this, turned back, and righteousness stands far away. Why? For truth has stumbled in the street, uh, and uprightness, unrighteousness, uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking, for he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw, remember he sees all things, uh, and it was dis- displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. See, if you're in a culture where from the head of the, the government on down uh, gets into lying and deception, falsehoods, Eventually, it unravels said culture, and there can be no justice, because justice is founded upon what? Truth. Truth. And he says, as I look at my culture, we growl like a bear, and we weep like doves. Why? Because God, more than anything else, we want to see justice in our land, righteousness reign, and we've got just the opposite. And so he's being bold in his prayer as, as a prophet to ask God for, to, to help you. Have you not felt like this before? You, you what you see, what you hear, what you process, either in your family, your work situation, in, uh, in, in the country, it just causes you to weep. And it's, God, I want to see justice, but how can I see it when, when there's no truth? Because truth stumbled in the street, and it cost them their nation. We live in a world where, uh, unfortunately, uh, lying and deception and falsehoods are the order of the day. And so what do we do in that? Well, what's the first point we're reviewing here? You, what should you do? Complain? Pray. No, pray. Pray. You should be prayerful. Number two, you should be bold. And bold in your prayer with great specificity. That's what he says. Deliver my Lord from a lying situation. That's what he does. Because we, I mean, I couldn't even begin to give you the list of the things I kind of wonder about as a person. You know? The things that our culture lies about. You could come up with your own list. And so he says, Lord, uh, uh, deliver me from this kind of culture. So Jeremiah, the prophet, who was the, as we've talked about last week, was the weeping prophet as he watched his nation implode, he could have absolutely written Psalm 120. Because notice what he says in uh, chapter 9, verse 2. He says, Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place, like a hotel, uh, that I might leave my people and go, go from them. I mean, I wish I could get out of Dodge. It's so evil, I'm running for the hills. He's like a prepper. I'm trying to make a real. You're th- see, I don't see that in the text. I'm adding, okay? It says, for all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men, and they bend their tongue like a bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil. I mean, they keep thinking up new stuff. And they don't know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor. Why? Well, don't trust near your brother uh, because every brother deals craftily. Every neighbor goes about uh, as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to do what? Speak lies. That's what the, 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 they do. They weary themselves committing iniquity. I mean, 
This is all they do. They've done it so much they can't even tell it's a lie. No wonder he says we, we growl like bears and we moan like doves. Jeremiah felt the same way. He could have written Psalm 120. In chapter 14, notice what uh, the prophet says uh, in verse 13. But he says, but ah, Lord God, look, look, the prophets, the spiritual leaders of the nation are telling them, quote, this is what they told the nation. You will not see sword, nor will you have famine, but I will give you lasting shalom in this place. Peace. See, people love to be told what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. I'm sorry, but if you come here, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. What am I going to tell you? The truth, what God wants you to hear. Uh, and that, that is what moves a person either toward the kingdom of God or moves them deeper into a walk with the king of the kingdom. Truth. That's what I want. And so when I look at the scriptures, it tells me uh, truth. He says, as a culture imploded, Jeremiah says, as my nation was about to be invaded by the Babylonians, he says, you know, Isaiah says, truth has stumbled in the street. Jeremiah goes, no kidding. It's totally stumbled. Uh, and what, what am I hearing? You know, what are they, what's the media putting out? The prophets, the religious leaders? Oh, Jeremiah is crazy. Don't listen to him because we're not going to be invaded and we're going to be Okay. And he has more to tell them if you keep on reading. In verse 14, Lord then said to me when he went to the Lord in prayer, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor even spoken by them. I don't even know who these guys are. He says, they are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. They thought this stuff up themselves. He says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, because God hears them, there shall be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine, these prophets shall meet their end. This is called lex talionis, or what goes around most certainly comes around. And so God gives them a word of warning. So his prayer uh, is, God, my culture has abandoned truth, and my prayer is bold for you to, to bring my culture back to truth. I mean, wouldn't you love to see this? So that when you are in conversations with people, you know they're talking about truth. And when you're watching the news, you know it's about truth. When a leader speaks, you know it's about truth. Now you're like, hmm, let's break it down. You get some, somebody comes to you, you have to give you a bid on uh, putting on a new roof. Do you trust that guy? Why are you so quiet? You know, I mean... I had, I had some trees in my backyard, that I, and they're quite large. They're like 100-foot uh, tulip poplars. They're right by my house. They're scary. They scare me. Because if they topple over, it's going to take out neighborhood. I mean, it's this. So I, I wanted to, So I had some guys trimming trees across the street from me uh, uh, this last week. And so I had them come over and give me an estimate. You know, oh, yeah, we could totally do this. Give you our best climber. Go in and strip it down. Take it down. Rope it. Drop each piece. Blah, blah, blah. I got a, you know, little uh, tractor over here. Pick up all the, I mean, we'll haul it all the way and put boards down to guard your turf. I heard all the right stuff. I'm going, ooh, cool. And the price was primo. And then I asked them a, you know, logical question because I'm a suspicious person. Uh, do you have a business license? Oh, yeah, we got one of those. Uh, what kind of insurance do you have? And could I have a copy of your insurance policy? Oh, yeah, we carry $2 million. Do you think I've heard from them this week? I did. I did. I heard from them. But they didn't include the insurance policy with the document that they sent me, the little letter saying we can do this. And then they left stuff out of what they said they were going to do, like take out the stumps, stumps for how much you're going to grind them for. They kind of left that out of the contract. And so I told them, uh, I used to be a true dreamer. <laughs> uh, you left out the stump removal. Oh, we did? Oh, sorry about that. We'll put that back in there. And what, could I have a copy of the, uh, of the document telling me you carry $2 million of insurance because you're taking these things down over my house? I'm waiting. It's like crickets. Do you really think they have a $2 million policy? Well, I'm suspicious. Remember, I'm kind of wondering because I'm in a culture that is prone for what? Lying and deception. I do not want Joe Blow hanging over my house with a chainsaw with branches that weigh hundreds of pounds kind of doing his thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you? Do you? And so if you want to be bold, uh, God, be bold and save me from people giving me bids that are based on lies, right? Move on. Verses 3 to 4. In addition to being prayerful, being bold, he says also be expectant. Verses 3 to 4. He says, what shall be given to you and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? He says, sharp arrows of the warrior with burning clothes, uh, coals of a broom tree. What in the world is he talking about? He's now talking about the lying person. 
And he says, what could be done to a person who constantly tells you lies? I have been with people who are, this is all they know. You cannot trust the thing they say. I've lived with them. And, and, it, and it, not in my personal family, but, you know, in my life, I've dealt with them. Yeah. I can just see somebody stopping Liz today when she come in and I didn't know. No. Yeah. I'm just saying as I've gone through life. So, like, what happens to a person who just lives in life? That's all they talk about. He says, well, uh, what's going to happen to that kind of person? He says, well, sharp arrows of a warrior and burning coals of a broom tree is what's going to happen to them. Really? So this is a, so a person who lies, their words are like sharp arrows. If you've ever been lied to or deceived or had a falsehood given to you, you know when it penetrates you, it's like a sharp arrow. You cannot believe they lied straight to your face. Um, and then it's kind of like a, a burning broom tree, uh, which was about a 12-foot tall uh, bush of a tree uh, in their culture. And it was known to burn a long time if you had a fire out in the desert. And you, you can know a coal fire, it looks like it's out but it doesn't take much to get it going again. That's kind of like lies and deception. Why? Well, I thought we dealt with that lie and the deception over there. It's like raging again. He, he says, God, what they do, may it come back around on them. They shot me with arrows. They burned me with their words, but may in due time it come around on them. That's what goes around, comes around, or you reap what you sow. In Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, you see it in action uh, with a priest called Pashur. It says, when Peshur the priest, the son of Emmer, who was the chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things that he didn't like because he was giving him the word of God. Peshur had Jeremiah the prophet beaten, talk about being canceled, and put in stocks uh, that were in the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of the Lord. Then it came about the next day when Peshur released Jeremiah from the stocks that Jeremiah said to him, quote, Peshur is not the name the Lord has given to you, but Magor Misabib. Thus the Lord has said, Behold, I am going to make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. And while your eyes look on, they will fall by the sword of your enemies. So I will I'll give Judah in, uh, over in, to the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will carry them away as exiles to the Babylon, and he will slay them with the sword. Translated, you attack the prophet of God with the false message. Well, what goes around comes around. And by the, how you measured out justice to him, which was injustice, it will come back to judge you. What is God's word to people who lie for a living? Uh, well, you can get away with it for a while, but eventually your sin finds you out. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 13 says, An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will escape from trouble. Have you ever set a mousetrap and been ensnared by your own trap? have you? I have. And I know how to set them. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, to be caught by your own trap. I mean, hello, to trigger it when you're trying to set it down and not let it go off and bam, you know, it, it, it gets you. Uh, it, this is like lies. Eventually they'll come back around and get you because the human mind can't control everything that you've said. And you're going to eventually find some leakage. Last thing he says <laughs> that you should do is be real, be real. I mean, be open and authentic to God. Notice what he says. In my situation of complexities of lies, when I look at myself, this is how I feel. Woe is me. I sojourn in Meshach, and I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long has my soul had its dwelling place uh, with those who hate this place. God, he says, I live in Meshach. And Meshach was, is in modern-day um, Turkey. Uh, they were the enemies of the Assyrians uh, and of the Jews. They were a very uh, armed people, a very uh, combative people. That's in the north. He says, down in the sa south in Kedar, these were nomadic uh, people. There's no actual sites for the people of Kedar, but they were known as a, as a nomadic group of people that moved around the deserts of southern Israel, where a modern-day side of Arabia is. Uh, and they were known to be armed to the teeth and highly barbaric. What Jew would want to live in either location? He said, you'd be out of your mind. But he goes, when I think about my culture, it's like I live in Meshach. It's like I live in Kedar. Have you not ever felt that as a saint? I'm looking at my country and I'm going, I thought I was in the U.S. Haven't you ever felt this? And it's like, what, what, what happened to truth, logic, morals, constitution, law, order, etc.? What in the world? I, I'm in Meshach. I feel like I live in Kedar. Woe is me. Because I live around people, gosh, they lie. They lie. They lie. What should you be about? Well, you should be about verse 7. And I close with this. You should be about what? 
peace. Uh, in the Hebrew text, there's no verb. Uh, it just says, so there's no copula, am. There's just I, peace in the Hebrew text, totally emphatic. He says, if you live in a culture, in a family of lies, in a business office of lies, what should you be about? Peace. You should be a peacemaker because a liar is a troublemaker. He said, you should be known for peace. What's a peacemaker? They're a person who tells the truth. So what's a peacemaker like? A peacemaker doesn't distort or misrepresent facts ever. A peacemaker doesn't spread lies ever. A peacemaker like Jesus exposes lies and liars. That's what he did. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, a whole chapter where he exposed liars. But he did it in love. Lastly, a peacemaker is known for being a person of their word. In Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16, uh, the prophet says this. These are the things which you should do as a Christian, he says. This is what God wants from you. Is what? Speak truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. It also says in the book of Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3, that when the Messiah returns, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world, and it will be known for shalom. But in the meantime, what should we be for? Peace. And peace is all about truth. What greater thing does our culture need than peacemakers who speak truth? Let's pray. God, help us to be the people you want us to be. As difficult, as complex, as uncomfortable as it might be, bathe us with love, compassion, uh, but to be uh, given to, to speaking the truth in love uh, and pointing people to the God of all truth. Thank you for who you are and how real the scriptures are. May our lives conform to who you are, which is truth in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you greatly this week and be the light. All right. Amen.